In a few minutes, the landing craft will reach the shore. Nearly 7,000 ships, with the fate of all of Europe at stake. The largest seaborne military operation of all time. These men are about to experience the most intense hours of their lives. I don't know how long exactly it was, but I was scared. I was really frightened. John Roman was 19 at the time. On June the 6th, 1944, in the early hours of dawn, he was preparing to land on the beaches of Normandy, along with 156,000 other men. I didn't know I was going to France. When we, get, when we got on a ship, we didn't know where we were going. At the same time, on the French side of the channel, no one was expecting to see an entire army arrive that day. That night, the Allies dropped 23,000 parachutists over the channel to sow confusion in the ranks of the German army. These parachutists led the way for thousands of ships to land the troops that would liberate France. Around 6.30 a.m., John's regiment was getting close to the beaches. The water was really rough. We were very sick. We were throwing up. It was an immense gamble, which could have turned into a fiasco. Seventy years after the events, some gray areas in the operation still exist. There are unknown facts, forgotten heroes, incredible deceptions, without which the fate of France would certainly not have been the same. It is this hidden side of the Normandy landing that we are going to show you. It all started one year earlier, in London. The date was July 1943. An ultra-secret bunker in the center of the city. This place, protected from bombs in the underground of the British capital, was where the man who had already been fighting Hitler for three years, the head of the British government, spent most of his time. Churchill War Rooms was effectively where Winston Churchill ran the war from. And this was a protected center underneath Great George Street, connected to 10 Downing Street, so easy access for the Prime Minister. This underground shelter had become his primary place of residence. In this room, he often met with his cabinet. In this room, his military staff worked. During the most difficult moments of the war, life went on underground for an entire sector of the government. He slept there, he did his work there, and it was the center of uh, the British war effort. In early 1943, Churchill knew the war had reached a crossroads. Hitler controlled all of mainland Europe, yet to the east, the German army had been bogged down for months on the Russian front fighting against Stalin's troops. The German losses were colossal, nearly two million men. For Churchill and his ally, President Franklin Roosevelt, it was time to launch a major attack in the West and free Europe by organizing the largest seaborne military operation in the history of mankind. There was never going to be any mystery about an impending invasion in 1944. The only two issues was precisely where and precisely when the invasion was going to take place. A landing, certainly, but where? 
The question obsessed Churchill and Roosevelt. Because this is what the Allies were facing if they launched an assault on the French coast. A wall. The Atlantic Wall. Along the 2,000 kilometers of French coastline, Hitler had constructed hundreds of bunkers, sheltering ultra-sophisticated and powerful artillery, behind which there were hundreds of thousands of German soldiers ready to drive back any landing attempts. The British, who are, 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 are much more nervous about mounting a large-scale attack before they think the time has come. Ils avaient peur. Ils respectaient énormément euh, l'adversaire allemand et ils craignaient d'être euh, tout simplement repoussés et, et, et de devoir réembarquer. The idea of a frontal attack against what was at the time the world's most powerful army was suicidal, pure and simple. This was the delivery of 170,000 troops onto open, well-defended beaches. This was one of the most extraordinary gambles uh, in, in history. The stakes were therefore enormous. But in July 1943, Churchill and Roosevelt's military command came to a decision. The landing would take place in Normandy. It was to minimize the risks, to ensure the fewest German forces would be facing the Allies when they landed, that Churchill conceived of a Machiavellian plan intended to deceive no less than Adolf Hitler himself. He wants the Fuhrer to believe that a landing operation was being prepared, but that it would happen elsewhere than in Normandy. It was essential that there should be an element of surprise, that the Axis had to be taken off guard. Partly, strategic deception is a result of the British personality and the British outlook on life. To stand back slightly, to, to look at a situation and see what can be done under the surface, what can be done behind the scenes, how this situation can be twisted, manipulated, in a slight and subtle way. November 1943. The deception was named Operation Fortitude. From his bunker, the Prime Minister mandated an ultra-secret organization, the London Controlling Section, with a mission. This is the only known photograph of this unit whose existence was revealed only in 1969. The man who ran the controlling section was named John Bevan. He was one of Churchill's most trusted men. His plan was to convince Hitler that the landing would take place in the Pas de Calais so that the Germans would concentrate all their troops there. For the deception to work, Bevan's team came up with a brilliant but preposterous scheme. Let's actually create this enormous, fictitious, entirely imaginary unit. And they were just ready and waiting to attack the Pas de Calais. This is what they dreamed up in order to create a dummy army. To fabricate fake airplanes, fake trucks, fake guns, fake tanks, and place them conspicuously in the region of Kent in southeast England, just opposite the Pas de Calais. The location was perfect for the Germans to spot. The vast countryside is completely flat. The enemy spy planes could easily detect the fake military installations. John Redmond knows everything about this phantom army. This historian is the only person who has studied every detail of the operation. This is a typical field that would, would be used not too far from a road so they could get the vehicles in. Um, plenty of space to set out their um, equipment. So just a nice little Kentish field, a little bit of cover, um, ideal. Everything that a real army needs had to be recreated 
visually, but in reality, it was smoke and mirrors. But the job was complex. It was November 1943, and the landing was supposed to take place in less than six months. They had to find a way to quickly produce a very large number of reliable decoys. For this, John Bevan's team turned to a fast-growing, newly developed technology. To discover it, we have to leave England and head to New York. Every year on Thanksgiving Day, Macy's department store organizes a spectacular parade down Fifth Avenue with immense balloons of famous characters. Millions of New Yorkers come to watch the show. It was these characters that inspired John Bevan's team. These giants were made from a revolutionary material, synthetic rubber, a particularly strong and lightweight material. This is exactly what Bevan's team needed to construct its fake army. American Industries were contacted to produce these decoys. And the Goodyear Company joined the project. Production began in February 1944. A few weeks later, the first elements of the fake army were delivered to Kent in England, where they were inflated by teams responsible for creating the illusion. Their task was to create the impression of something like 40 divisions in Kent. Now, 40 divisions, when you multiply that up, is just under a million men. The result was astonishing. In just a few minutes, the camouflage teams managed to inflate an American tank. It looked completely authentic, with a turret, track and gun. The illusion was perfect, and the soldiers could move around it with amazing ease. As planned, they were light, and incredibly rugged. there would be a time that they'd have to move some of the dummies during the day. And it is said that one day, a farmer going along the field boundary saw four troops carrying a Sherman tank. What he thought isn't recorded, but by God, military rations must have been very good to be able to lift a tank. <laughs> the teams were attentive to every last detail. They even created real tracks like these behind the columns of rubber tanks. But Bevan's team also ordered hundreds of fake landing craft, which they placed up and down the coast of Kent and in the region's rivers. The stage was set. A gigantic army appeared ready to cross the channel towards Calais. A fake army, which even had its own name, FUSAG for First US Army Group. But, to make it fully believable, it still needed one more element, a leader. Fortitude's boss, John Bevan, asked that a commander, a real one, be named to head up this ghost army. And he snagged the most famous of them all. General Patton, the American the Germans feared the most. Ils l'admirent. Pour eux, c'est un grand général. C'est un fonceur, c'est un excellent stratège, c'est un, un officier qu'ils aimeraient bien avoir dans leur armée. Wearing his heavy helmet, his ivory handle colt on his hip, Patton was the most high profile military man in the American army. He had built a reputation as a fearless warrior. C'est un bulldog. C'est un bulldog. Ces hommes qui les mène vraiment la baguette, quoi. C'est pas le géant de gars qui va les border le soir. Above all, he was ambitious. The North African campaign, 
the landing in Sicily. Since the beginning of the war, he'd had a string of one spectacular blitz after another against the Germans. Bevan would use a specific aspect of his personality. Patton adored the spotlight and cameras. He never went unnoticed. So Bevan organized inspection tours in Kent to further convince the Germans as to the existence of the ghost army. Patton played his role perfectly. Patton is being photographed in the southeast of England. The point is to make it look as though he really is the, the, the head of a, of, of a large army that is based in southeast England and is likely to attack the Pas de Calais. And the Germans are, completely believe the fact that, that, that um, the Fusag uh, will, will, will be commanded by Patton. And having believed it, they're going to expect to see the proof of him actually being there. And so when they see these photographs of him, it's going to make sense to them. He, he, he's coming. And the press couldn't get enough of him. We have, for example, an issue of the Daily Express, a major English daily dated April the 24th, 1944. On page four, a box announced that Patton would inspect a second front in Europe. This is the type of information Bevan wanted, because he knew that the Germans who read the press would conclude that a general of his stature had to be at the command of a large army. Armored divisions made of rubber and a charismatic commanding general. For the Germans, everything pointed to a landing in the Pas de Calais. But how much longer would they still believe this hoax? In April 1944, John Bevan was increasingly haunted by this question. Meanwhile, on the other side of England, in the southwest, the Allies' real army was in preparation. And Bevan had a single fear, that the Germans would realize that the target was the Normandy beaches. To avoid this risk, he wanted the Germans to be totally focused on the fake army and especially wanted them to be obsessed with a landing in the Pas de Calais. Bevan believed he had the man for the job. He was an adventurer, a figure totally unknown to the public at large, and yet he played a major role in changing the course of history. The story of this man had begun five years earlier, in Spain. The year was 1939, the place Madrid. A civil war had been raging in the country for nearly three years. Fratricidal battles had killed more than 150,000 people, and by this point, the country was run by a dictator, General Franco. One man was particularly horrified by the atrocities of war. His name was Juan Pujol. He was 24 years old. He decided to devote his life to combating any form of dictatorship. His experience in the Spanish Civil War taught him that the Nazis would destroy civilization in Europe. And he was absolutely determined that the rest of Europe should not suffer what he had seen in Spain. To fight the Nazis, this young man concocted a mad scheme. One morning in January 1941, Juan Pujol walked determinedly to the British Embassy. And said, I want to help. An utterly unknown person offered his services as a spy, although he had no experience whatsoever. The English thought he was daft. They wanted nothing to do with him and turned him away. Uh, who is this person? The British diplomat who interviewed him said, mind your own business. Spain is neutral. You are a non-competent. Keep out of it. Pujol was extremely disappointed. He hadn't thought he'd be sent away so abruptly. Yet he understood that to earn the trust of the English, he would have to prove himself. So he set out on an extremely high-risk project.
A few days later, in Madrid, the young Spaniard went to 2 Promenade de la Castellana, the address of another embassy, the embassy of the country he detested fiercely, Germany, because he had come up with a unique ploy. The only way to get the British interested is to offer his services to the Germans first as a spy, and so get enough information through working for the Germans that he then can go back to the British and say, look, look at all this information I've got. You need it, you can't turn me down now. Juan Pujol offered to spy for the Nazis with the clear intention of betraying them to the Allied forces. He lied so he'd be taken seriously. He led them to believe he worked for the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and that he even had a diplomatic passport with which he could travel easily to England. And as surprising as it seems, the Germans fell for his story. To have somebody supporting the Axis cause and willing, volunteering to do this work, this is a gift from God, particularly where you have a shortage of agents already on the ground in, in the UK. Because at the time, virtually all of the Reich spies in England had been exposed and arrested. Meanwhile, at the German embassy, the head of secret services, a man named Karl Erich Kulenthal, decided to test Juan Pujol. This is the sheet of paper he gave him with specific questions. What aircraft are used in the various Royal Air Force units? What is the composition of the Bomber Command? To answer these questions, Pujol had to travel to Great Britain. An incredible adventure was about to begin. To get to England from Spain during the war, he would, in principle, have to go through the port of Lisbon in Portugal. Pujol therefore traveled to the Portuguese capital in July of 1941, with no intention of going any further. Once there, he started working in the public library. For several months, he consulted guidebooks and encyclopedias and drew on his active imagination to embellish his messages with details, then sending pseudo-information to the German secret services that seemed to be credible but were completely fictitious. He was a very imaginative man. He created these stories about, for example, huge, uh, enormous landing craft that, 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 that were being tried out, tested on Lake Windermere in the north of England. These were all out of his own imagination. For example, Lake Windermere near Scotland does exist, but the giant ship described by Pujol never did. What was even more incredible is that the head of German secret services, Karl Erich Kulenthal, didn't suspect a thing. It's a miracle that the Germans didn't read this and think, this is nonsense. The young Spaniard was therefore able to provide the Germans with dozens of fake documents and earn their trust. Even though just a few months earlier, the English had refused Pujol as a spy, at this point, they started to take a serious interest in him. His fate was decided in the English countryside north of London at Bletchley Park. Behind the imposing facade of this mansion and the bucolic countryside was concealed one of the best kept secrets of the Allied arsenal. This was the headquarters of the English counterintelligence services. Churchill, in particular, had brought together the brightest minds in Britain for a mission of utmost importance, intercepting and deciphering all the radio messages broadcast by the German army. Les Anglais 
à Bletchley Park ont pris les plus grands cerveaux britanniques. C'est tous des gens qui sortent des plus hautes universités britanniques. C'est la bande, la bande d'Oxford et la bande de Cambridge. All of the most brilliant mathematicians, engineers, linguists and military experts in England were gathered here. In total secrecy, they developed an incredible machine, the forerunner of the first computers. The Ultra Machine. It was an enormous calculator, the most powerful of its time. Thanks to this machine, since 1941, the Allies had been able to crack the codes used by the enemy to encrypt its radio messages. The Germans didn't know this, but many of their top secret exchanges were intercepted and decoded by the English. In April 1942, Bletchley Park intercepted a strange message, one the secret services found extremely intriguing. This was the message. On April the 2nd, 1942, a German spy with the code named of Alaric, based in Madrid, informed the German secret services that a convoy of 16 British ships was about to leave the port of Liverpool. Cross the Atlantic and sail through the Strait of Gibraltar to resupply the Allied troops on the island of Malta in the Mediterranean. When the English deciphered this message, they were extremely surprised because in fact, There were no plans whatsoever for a convoy of this type. They were thinking, these, these aren't true. These messages, th th these are nonsense. The Allies knew this convoy didn't exist. The Germans, however, believed categorically in the spies' information. Several days later, German ships set out in pursuit of the imaginary convoy, spending days crisscrossing the Mediterranean looking for it. The English couldn't believe it. The Allies were baffled by the huge, intense efforts being made in the Western Mediterranean by the enemy to find and destroy this non-existent convoy. This was one man operating by himself with thousands of troops. So the British decided to find out a little bit more about this unusual spy who was able to get the Germans to swallow anything. Now, it's clear that whoever this, this, this strange pretend spy was, he had the ear of the Germans and he had to be brought on side by the British. The services of Bletchley Park set out to find the mysterious spy and soon discovered that Alaric was none other than Juan Pujol, the young Spaniard who had volunteered to join the English espionage services. The man was immediately recruited. The fake German spy became a genuine double agent working for the Allies. He took on a code name, Garbo, a tribute to the American actress. One of the best ways to put across a deception is to get double agents to do it. Et ils vont se dire, Juan Pujol est l'agent parfait pour intoxiquer l'adversaire. And the English would assign this gifted manipulator to their most important secret operation, Fortitude. Juan Pujol, alias Garbo, moved to a street in downtown London, near German Street. To eliminate any last doubts the Germans may have had about the existence of FUSAG, an army of one million men stationed in Kent opposite Calais, they had to receive confirmation of this information from several different sources. Garbo came up with a brilliant idea. He explained to his German handlers that he'd managed to recruit new spies all throughout England. In all, 27 agents were apparently working for him. His imagination was boundless. He had a Venezuelan student up in Glasgow. He had an Indian nationalist in Dover. He had uh, a, a waiter in a canteen in the south of England. These were all people that lived in his mind. And over a period of six months, Garbo spent every day in his small London office 
writing up the hundreds of fake messages that had supposedly been sent to him by his imaginary spies. Garbo spending up to three hours a night on the radio transmitting these reports to his German controller. Lo que sí recuerdo es que mamá se quejaba muchísimo porque papá tenía que salir, todo, mi padre tenía que salir todas las noches y se pasaba largas horas por la noche, me imagino que trabajando para hacer estos mensajes, escribirlos, mandarlos. But together, these hundreds of short messages led the Germans to convince themselves that Patton's army would attack the Pas de Calais. All these different little things, each one on their own meant nothing. But when they were placed together, they actually started to tell a story to the Germans. You are supplying to your adversary small pieces of the puzzle. The Germans would receive these pieces of information and start to say, aha, FUSAG, there is a unit that is building up in this particular area of Southeast England. And we can deduce that from these little messages that Garbo is sending us. The Germans took the bait. By this point in Berlin, Adolf Hitler's military command was convinced that the Allies were preparing to land in the north. In fact, hadn't German planes returned with aerial photographs showing numerous landing craft in the port of Dover opposite Calais? The Germans didn't even suspect that this impressive army was made of rubber decoys. They couldn't imagine that these boats were merely inflatable toys. Indeed, on the German high command map, we can see where the Reich spies believed the Anglo-American forces to be stationed. In Kent, in the southwest, these small flags represent hundreds of thousands of men and armored vehicles. In reality, there were only fake tanks in this region. This map is dated May the 15th, 1944, less than one month from D-Day. Believing they could block the landing, the German army kept a majority of its troops, dozens of thousands of men, including the fearsome 15th Army, in the north. This is exactly what Garbo wanted. And this is exactly what the Allies needed for a successful operation in Normandy. Around 2 a.m. on June the 6th, 1944, Operation Overlord began. The fate of all of Europe was at stake. This was the largest seaborne military invasion of all time. Nearly 7,000 ships from eight different navies, including the U.S. Navy, the British Royal Navy, and the Free French Naval Forces. On board, 132,000 soldiers. Among them, many very young men, like John Roman. He's 89 years old now. At the time, in 1944, he was just 90. Like one and a half million young Americans, he crossed the Atlantic where he would discover a continent entirely unknown to him. He was among the first landing units. The night before, he still had no idea of his final destination. I didn't know I was going to France. When we, get, when we got on a ship, we didn't know where we were going. On June the 6th alone, with the parachutists, a total of 156,000 men attempted to land on the five Normandy beaches. The boat carrying John and his regiment headed toward Utah Beach. The trip was horrendous. I don't know how long exactly it was, but I was scared. I was really frightened. We were very sick, but it was, the water was really rough. We were, tr we were tr throwing up. At 6.30 a.m., the first troops stormed the beaches. John's boat was still far from the beach when the lieutenant gave his regiment the order to jump. 
He and his fellow soldiers had to struggle through hundreds of meters in the water, carrying 40 kilo packs on their backs. The water was up to here, and I can't swim. But we had the backpacks, the big backpacks on our uh, thing, and that held us up. So we kept on fighting until we got to shore. The German soldiers opposing the GIs had an enormous advantage. They were sheltered in fortified positions that were equipped with cannons and machine guns. We were being shelled all the time by, by the Germans. A lot of us and were uh, killed. At Utah Beach, 200 of John's fellow soldiers were struck down by German bullets. Losses were even heavier on the four other landing beaches. More than 3,500 soldiers were killed, and more than twice that wounded in a few hours, particularly on Omaha Beach, which would end up being known by the tragic name of Bloody Omaha. But after hours of fighting, the Allies began to tip the balance. Within three days, the Americans, English, and Canadians had captured strategic positions, and the coast was under the control of the Liberators. The landing was a success, and the priority for the Americans was to capture Cherbourg, the region's largest port, before moving on to Paris. This was vital to ensure the resupply of troops and logistics. On the roads of Normandy, the first contacts between civilians and the soldiers. Like many GIs, John was greeted as a hero by enthusiastic French people and by overtly demonstrative young women. They're singing and jumping around and uh, bringing some wine and whatever they had they could afford. They would even hop on the jeeps, and uh, they would go crazy. That's what they would do, really. It doesn't bother me. Children, as well, were fascinated by these soldiers who looked like they came from another planet. Like Francis Le Pesqueur, who was eight years old when he first saw the GIs. Des soldats d'une très grande gentillesse qui nous gavé de friandises, de cigarettes pour les adultes. Et pour nous, ils venaient d'un autre monde. C'était quelque chose de phénoménal. Ils nous donnaient du chocolat, ils donnaient du sucre, parce que j'en manquais de sucre. Des bonbons, c'était bizarre, ça. Le chewing-gum, nous avons découvert le chewing-gum, que nous ne connaissions pas. On nous avait dit surtout ne pas avaler, parce que <rire> Mais nous ne savions pas. <rire> Behind the front lines, the American army was building huge rest and relax camps, known as R&R. There were better food rations, American newspapers, mail from the family, and baseball games, just like home. It was the American way of life transplanted to the Normandy countryside. C'est une façon de, de, de sortir de la guerre un temps, de, de se détendre, de faire en sorte qu'on ait un bon soldat quand il revient au combat. Homesick GIs could feel just like they were home. Both in the city and in fields, the army invited its soldiers to the movies, screening Hollywood's biggest hits like Casanova Brown with Gary Cooper and The Great Dictator by Charlie Chaplin. Francis, who was eight at the time, discovered American films in a theater built in the middle of the countryside. Il y a eu euh, la première séance de cinéma que j'ai connue de ma vie, c'était dans un champ à un kilomètre d'ici. On nous a passé un film, euh, c'était Charlot à l'époque. Alors là, nous étions... Nous savions pas ce que c'était que le cinéma. J'avais jamais vu un film. Et là, c'était l'émerveillement, quoi. Cherbourg was liberated on June the 27th, 1944. And from that day on, there were dances nearly every week. 
The port had nearly 30,000 men working to supply the front for many long months. The American army set up no less than 12 orchestras for them, consisting of soldiers who were also musicians. Dans leur pactage, ils amènent leurs trompettes, ils amènent leur, leur saxophone, les trombones. Ils trouvent aussi sur place parfois de quoi s'exprimer, piano, batterie. On dansait de tout là, nous. On dansait, on dansait des danses autrefois. Hein. Pas, pas des remues fesses comme maintenant, on dansait des danses. And any place would do. Like this abandoned spot, the Amio Factory where one of the most famous dances in the Cherbourg region was held. Le premier bal qui a eu donc c'était à l'usine d'Amio, on était 2000. En oh, cette soirée. That night a GI invited Paulette to dance. She was amazed by his style. Oh, une liane, il dansait pas de voir comme il faisait qu'elle veut dire good good. These dances were like a fresh breeze of freedom for the French. Nothing like this had happened in France for a long time. Après quatre ans, ces fameuses années noires, euh, les balles, bah, tout le monde est preneur, hein, les civils comme les militaires. And to give the GIs an extra advantage, the American army eliminated all competition. Some dances were reserved exclusively to women. In an advertisement that appeared in the local paper, the army had organized special transportation to take them to the dance. Cars will pick up the guests, women, at 7 p.m. in front of the Collège de Jeunes Filles on Rue de la Duché. When they had such balls where Frenchmen were excluded, the Frenchmen would gather around the entranceway trying to get in. Inevitably, there would be fights and so on and so forth. But you can see why they would avoid inviting the Frenchmen because uh, obviously if they did that, there would be no women for them to dance with. Some of these organized events just provided fun for an evening, but others created true love stories. A few months after the landing on Utah Beach, John Roman was in eastern France in the Ardennes in Charleville, which had just been liberated. And one night, his entire life would change. A friend came and he said, uh, hey, John, let's go get a beer. So we went up to the uh, little cafe and we heard music. So we went in and we were by the bar and then the music starts playing. That night, John noticed Jacqueline. She was 17 years old and worked as a secretary at the town hall. He invited her to dance, but she was not going to give in easily. Jacqueline, she, she says, she just takes off and goes and sits down. And so I, I went back to the bar, and then my friend came back, and I said, she won't answer me, but I said, I'm going to try again. Jacqueline had a strong personality. But John didn't give up and managed to win her heart. Today, the two are still together. Ils continuaient à venir à table, à m'embêter. Alors finalement, ma sœur me dit, mais danse avec lui une fois et puis tu... il te laissera tranquille. 68 ans après. <laughs> One year later, Jacqueline married her handsome GI at the town hall of Charleville and went to live with him in the United States. Together they would have six children, 14 grandchildren and 17 great-grandchildren. Like Jacqueline, 6,000 French women married GIs in the year following the landing but these stories remained an exception. The relationships between the American soldiers and French women were sometimes more problematic. The American army was even somewhat overwhelmed by the testosterone of its soldiers. When the city of Cherbourg was liberated, 
dozens of prostitutes offered their charms to the thousands of soldiers who wanted to forget the war. There was a such demand that the files of waiting were created at infinite in the streets, des bagarres, sans doute, pour avoir une place dans la file d'attente, eh bien, sont, sont apparaissent. Et je pense que des soldats aussi sont, sont ivres. And worse, the disturbances by the American troops were sometimes worse than late night noise or alcohol fueled rowdiness. Sometimes the events turned tragic. There was violence, rape, and crime. One man dared to take on one of the taboos of history many years after the end of World War II. To meet this man, we go to Cincinnati in the United States, 400 kilometers southeast of Chicago. Robert Lilly is a sociologist and criminologist. He's a professor at Northern Kentucky University. He spent 20 years studying the archives of American military courts, analyzing the testimony of experts and comparing witness reports. And in 2003, he published a book that hit like a bombshell. Its title, Taken by Force, dealing with rapes committed by American soldiers during World War II, notably in France. According to Robert Lilly, the first rapes in Normandy occurred just a few days after the landing. You have the combination of uh, perhaps uh, not well-trained soldiers, not the cream of the crop, uh, who are armed, who are drunk, and the, one of the results is uh, extreme brutality that results from that. These terrible events remained secret for many years. Seventy years later, few witnesses remain, and not many of them want to revive these memories. Francis Le Pesqueur was the man from Normandy who, at the age of eight, discovered movies thanks to the GI. For us, he agreed to remember a painful episode from the war. A day in 1944, when one of his mother's cousins was raped by two American soldiers. Her name was Marie. She was 19 years old and worked on a farm. The tragedy took place here, near the village of Kettu, two months after the landing. En fin d'après-midi, ce 1er août 1944, deux Américains en armes sont arrivés du chemin. Ils sont sortis du virage et sont venus ici, euh, demander à boire à Madame Hébert, la patronne. The two GIs ordered cider. Madame Hébert obeyed and sent her employee Marie into the basement for a bottle. But after drinking the bottle, the soldiers became aggressive. Ensuite, ils sont venus vraiment gênants, euh, entreprenants. Et Madame Hébert a été prise de panique a essayé dans un premier temps de demander du secours ici, mais la personne avait très peur, elle a fermé la porte. C'était un peu embêtant, mais c'était comme ça. Et Madame Hébert a fait demi-tour, a perdu ses sabots ici à peu près. Elle est partie nu-pied et à l'endroit où il y a la petite barrière à peu près, elle a été rattrapée par un soldat qui l'a massacré à coups de casque lourd sur les épaules, sur la tête. Et elle était très mal en point. Meanwhile, the other soldier pulled Marie into the field and raped her at knife point. Hearing the screams, the farm's owner, Monsieur Hébert, and a farm worker tried to intervene, but they were then attacked. Un de ces soldats a aligné l'employé, il a mis une balle dans le ventre. Le deuxième Américain a également violé cette malheureuse jeune femme. The military police launched an investigation the following day. It reenacted the sequence of events around the Hébert home and interviewed witnesses. They found the shells of the bullets fired at the crime scene. The soldiers from the American camp, located one kilometer from the farm, were all questioned. The guilty men were quickly found. 
There is blood on one of the uniforms that the soldier wears. Uh, and then once he gets back to camp, he, he throws it away, but it, and it's discovered. So uh, they find that, and uh, uh, his name is on that particular pair of, of trousers. So they were able to identify that he was there. The second soldier was shown the pieces of his rifle found on the crime scene. This was the weapon used to strike Monsieur Hébert. The two GIs were brought before an American court-martial at Cherbourg. The first one confessed to the rape, but the second one denied everything. One of the soldiers uh, says that the, uh, the, the rape was consensual, that she agreed to it. Uh, he calls the 19-year-old uh, the victim a liar that goes all the way up to Eisenhower. General Eisenhower was the supreme commander of the Allied forces. Notified of the crimes committed by the American soldiers, he had a clear policy, no leniency. The two GIs who raped Marie and killed the boy at the farm were sentenced to death by hanging. Eisenhower says, execute them near where they committed the crime. Not inside prisons where you can't see it happen. Take them to the public. I want the soldiers to be educated that you can't get away with this, and I want the French to know we're doing the best they can to fight it. The execution took place in a field near the Hébert farm, in public, and in the presence of Marie, the victim. According to Robert Lilly's research, 49 American soldiers were sentenced to death for rape during the liberation. 21 were hanged. But not all the rapists were identified. The American Military Justice Archives recorded a total of 181 rapes by GIs on French soil between June 1944 and June 1945. The 181 official cases represent a low figure. It is likely that a number of women who were raped never filed official complaints. These abuses were considered a taboo subject for many years, gray areas overshadowed by the heroism of the soldiers who liberated France.